Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Grand Forks, our live stream divine service for this Sunday, Palm Sunday. Today, Christians around the world are celebrating the Lord's entry into Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday. We'll begin with a service that highlights that, but as it is also the beginning of Holy Week, we conclude our service today with a reading of our Lord's Passion and those events that have transpired this week to culminating in his death and his on the cross and his burial at the end of the service. I invite you to participate in the divine service as if you were here with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Speak and chant the congregational parts, sing the hymns, stand and sit as if you were gathered together in this place with us. Today we also have the Reverend Daniel Silsley from Wittenberg Chapel with us as our guest preacher. I invite you now to stand as we begin the Liturgy of Passion Sunday. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem with palms in their hands gathered to greet your dearly beloved Son when he came into his holy city, grant that we may ever hail him as our King, and when he comes again may go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him that day was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace in the name of the Lord.
Bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for Palm Sunday is written in the prophet Isaiah, the 50th chapter. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who were taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Christ entered once for all into the holy places by means of his own blood. Thus securing an eternal redemption. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. The epistle is written in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the Holy Gospel. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever, loses his, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? 
But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, He departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it sure is a strange feeling to hear the account of this crowd of people gathering around Jesus and lifting up their voices and shouts of praise, and yet the place where we usually gather around our Lord, the place where we usually lift up our voices in praise to Him, is silent, empty. I'm sure this isn't how any of us planned to begin our Holy Week this year. And yet even though this sanctuary is silent, this Palm Sunday cry of the crowd has undoubtedly been on the lips of many people in recent weeks. Lord, save us. That's what Hosanna means. Lord, save us. It's a common petition, especially in times of oppression, times of suffering, times of uncertainty and fear. Lord, deliver us from this evil. Spare us the suffering that we're enduring. Lord, save us. It's a simple prayer. And like all prayers, this prayer of Hosanna should be prayed according to the Lord's promises. That is to say, when we pray for salvation, we should pray for the salvation that Christ has promised to bring, not the salvation that we would prefer. And that's a good thing to keep in mind, especially at a time when it's very easy to tell God what he should be doing to fix our problem. If only he would intervene in the way that we think he should intervene, then everything would be just fine. But when we pray, Lord, save us, Hosanna, it should be on his terms, not ours. That's why it's worth considering this morning what that original Palm Sunday crowd had in mind when they shouted these words at Jesus and when they laid their cloaks on the ground and when they waved their palm branches in the air. What kind of salvation did they seek? This crowd was, of course, in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, the high feast of Passover. And and John also tells us, though, that some of these crowd was gathered specifically around Jesus that day because of a wondrous miracle that he had performed, a miracle he performed not long before he had entered in Jerusalem. And we heard it last week, the remarkable story of Jesus giving us a preview of the last day by undoing death itself. Remember, his friend Lazarus had died Mary and Martha were there weeping. Jesus himself weeps at the death of his friend. But then Jesus shows forth the glory of God by raising to life a man who was four days in the tomb and doing it with nothing more than a word. And not surprisingly, the crowds that saw that miracle, they were amazed and they didn't keep quiet about it. They continually testified about it. And because of it, many people were following after Jesus. It was such a miracle that even the Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus because the miracle was making people follow after Christ. They wanted to undo the work of Christ and put Lazarus back in the grave. Anything to silence this Christ. But even if the religious leaders aren't too happy about Christ's mighty deeds, John tells us that this Palm Sunday crowd has gathered around Christ precisely because of his miraculous works. And they would have him as their king. That's what they say, right? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Again, what kind of king do they have in mind? It's not the first time that the crowd had tried to make Jesus king. Remember back when Jesus fed the 5,000 miraculously? He has to withdraw by himself. Why? Because the crowd wanted to make him king by force. And who could blame them? I mean, who wouldn't want a king 
who could multiply food endlessly in his kingdom so that hunger was no more? Who wouldn't want a king who could lead troops into the battle that were not afraid to die because they knew their captain could raise them with a word? Such a kingdom would have no rival. It'd be the most powerful kingdom in the world, and God's people would finally be vindicated from their enemies. Yes, Hosanna indeed. Lord, save us. Blessed is this Jesus, even the King of Israel. And yet, you know the rest of the story. You know what will happen to this Jesus only five days later. When that Palm Sunday crowd cries out, Hosanna, they seem to be very mistaken about who this Jesus is, about what kind of salvation he comes to bring, about what kind of king he is and what his kingdom truly looks like. So you see that as we read and meditate upon this account of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that crowd and their prayer of Hosanna forces us to take a look at our own prayers, our own expectations of Christ. Think back to when this Lenten season began over five weeks ago on Ash Wednesday. Most of us probably didn't expect to see everything that has happened in the world and in our country since then. It began as kind of a standard Lenten season. We came forward, we received the ashen crosses on our foreheads, a sober reminder that we are dust and to dust we shall return, and then we went about our daily lives as normal. And yet, in recent weeks, our dusty mortality has become even more apparent and less easy to ignore. And in situations like that, our prayers can easily become questions, accusatory questions, questions that force God to justify himself to us about why he isn't acting and intervening the way that we think he should be. And it's not just in the face of a global pandemic that this happens. It's simply how our weak and sinful flesh is tempted to respond any time that we experience suffering or sickness or discomfort or death, thinking that we somehow deserve better than all of that, thinking that God and his kingdom should be more apparent and more powerful so that it's easy to cry out to God, Lord, save us, when his work is obvious and mighty. But it's a lot more difficult when he appears weak and powerless. And into that temptation, I would remind us of the second petition of the Lord's Prayer that we pray. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? Luther reminds us in the small catechism that the kingdom of God certainly comes by itself without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. And how does God's kingdom come? Well, God's kingdom is among us, not when everything is going just as we think it should, not when God seems to have answered all of our prayers in just the way that we wanted, not when the cancer is healed, not when our political agenda is being advanced, not when coronavirus is gotten under control. No, it's much simpler than that. God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit. Why? So that by His grace we would believe His Word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. Which means that God's kingdom comes not in the absence of suffering and sin, not when Jesus is the King that we think He should be, but, but rather God's kingdom comes right into the midst of our suffering and sin. And it happens wherever Christ and his holy word is preached into your ears. There is God's kingdom for you. There is the Holy Spirit doing his work, not to make your life great and wonderful and without pain and suffering, but rather to sustain you in the one true faith, regardless 
of your life circumstances. See, that crowd on Palm Sunday may have misunderstood who Jesus was and what he truly came to accomplish, but that doesn't mean he ignores their prayer. They cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us, and he does. He answers their prayer and ours in a better way than we could have ever imagined by saving us from the greatest enemy that we would ever face. And five days later, when Jesus heard the words, Hail, King of the Jews, it was to mock him. He was certainly given a king's crown, but it was not made of gold and not lined with rubies, but rather made of thorns and encrusted with his own precious blood. His throne was a wooden and cursed tree, a crucified Messiah, which according to all worldly wisdom is no Messiah worth having. Right? Like Paul says in Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to we who are being saved, the power of God. You see, in God's profound wisdom and mercy, that crucified Messiah is the answer to your prayer, Hosanna. For it is upon that crucified King, reigning in humility and weakness, it's upon Him that all of your sin has been laid. All of God's righteous wrath upon your sin was poured out upon Christ instead of you. God made that Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for you, so that in him you would become the righteousness of God. He reigns there over your sin and over your unrighteousness, over your enmity with God. And dear saints, that is enough. Whether the cancer gets healed or not, Christ and his word are enough. Regardless if your bank account is overflowing or you're struggling to make ends meet or you find yourself unemployed, Christ and his word are enough. Whether you have decades of life ahead of you or death is just around the corner, Christ and his word are enough. And in the midst of a global pandemic that may stretch for months and months, Christ and his word are enough. Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Let us pray, not according to our preferences, but according to the Lord's promises. Let us pray that the Lord would indeed save us and then rejoice that he has answered that prayer in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand and we confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church, that the Lord would defend her against all her enemies, and keep her true to Jesus Christ by the power of your word and spirit. Gracious Lord, keep your church in your mercy, that she may endure the assaults of the evil one and remain faithful for the sake of those numbered within your kingdom and those who have not yet heard the gospel and been brought to faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all pastors, for all church work vocations, and for all the baptized in their vocation as God's people. 
Almighty God, by your spirit, you have established us as your church and granted to us particular vocations within the church, home and community in which to serve you. Grant to us every gift and blessing needful that we may honor our calling and serve you to the best of our ability through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism, for the newly baptized, for those being catechized as children and adults, and for those joining our congregation. Almighty Father, your word will not return to you empty, but will accomplish your purpose. Hear us on behalf of those who have heard your word, who are being baptized into Christ and joining the fellowship of our congregation, that they may keep the faith with holy and joyful hearts, trusting in Christ as their Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the government, for all in authority over us, and for our own lives as citizens and neighbors. Almighty Lord, you have established the kingdom of the left and hold accountable all those who govern in this and every place. Guide our president, the members of Congress, the governor of this state, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they would serve nobly and wisely, pursuing the path of justice and protecting those least able to protect themselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for an end to violence and terror, for those imprisoned, for the troubled in mind, and for those who suffer any affliction of the body. Merciful Lord, your grace is sufficient for all our needs, and you have promised to be the strength of the weary, the hope of those who fear, the healing of the ill, the fullness of those disabled, and the peace of all who are distressed. Hear us on behalf of Bill, Gary, Floyd, Lois, Naomi, Wayne, Alan, Nicole, Ken, Nathan, Christiana, Isabel, Daryl, Anna, Linda, Teresa, Dan, Julie, Dietrich, Lorna, John, Judy, Carol, Tim, Susan, Jim and Lynn, and Mike and all whom we name in our hearts, that they may be well supplied by your grace in their time of trouble, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those not yet of the kingdom, that God would make us bold to speak the faith to them, and that hearing they might believe. Everlasting Father, it is your will that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of your Son by faith. Give, give to your word success and deliver from error all those who live in darkness, that they may walk in the light of the Lord Jesus, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the earth to be fruitful and for our good use of all the fruits of the earth. Blessed Lord, you give food to the hungry and provide for all our needs in this mortal life. Grant to us a grateful heart and knowledge to use wisely and well all that you have entrusted to our care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our unity of doctrine and faith. Holy Lord, guard us against false teaching and help us to discern truth from error that none may be led astray or lost from the fellowship of your Son. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
the reading of our Lord's Passion from St. Matthew. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, those whose whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been bored. Judas who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation.
See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At least two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. When he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, And she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and he hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, 
the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave them the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put out a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross." So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them once, at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. 
And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. And there were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, and among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is, day after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. We thank you once again for joining us for this divine service as we remember our Lord's entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and again hearing the Passion reading of our Lord from St. Matthew. A reminder that this week we have services on Thursday and Friday. Thursday on Holy Thursday, April 9th at 7 p.m. Friday, Good Friday, uh, April 10th at 7 p.m. And then we invite you to join us next Sunday for the resurrection of our Lord. The divine service will be at 10 a.m. Everything will be live streamed. We encourage you to continue to support the work of the church with your gifts and offerings. We have been uh, greatly surprised by the number of giving and ask that you would continue to remember the church as we continue together in ministry even at this time.